Welcome to FAQ number five. Starting to get a little bit of a routine out here and it's nice. I've got a few loaded up already to make this easy. So first question was about the container size and Rantan Plan says, how important are the dimensions of the container? Do the plants prefer tall, height to width of two to one, square, height to width of one to one, or squat containers, does it, or does it not matter at all? I would say that the, the roots are gonna mimic the container size, and what's above that is going to be best representative of the canopy. So in hydro, you can take a little container and you can drip the nutrients uh, in there so that they're always adequate and you can grow a big plant above a very small root system because the root system is going to be force-fed nutrients. When you are in soil, you want the roots to be spreading and they're gonna pick up nutrients at their fresh growing tip a little better. That's why a volume of soil that's larger than we need is advantageous. The roots can keep moving, going around, and they're gonna keep picking up nutrients a little bit easier than if they were swirled in a small spot because we can't do it on demand like hydro. Even though I reference like shape and roots and stuff, I've noticed that deeper and taller is not better. I like a wider, more shallow, more squat arrangement. And so if you picture a four by four bed, usually they're one foot deep of soil at most a foot and a half deep, but they're four foot wide and they work very well. The earth box, it is a rectangle that is squat. It's not as tall as it is wide. And I'd say that that Ratio works very well. It's super important in the earth box because it has this lift of water from below. And I think if you're too tall, then the water can't wick all the way up. The hydraulic pressure is greater. In a regular soil container, that's not really the same. Most often we're watering from the top down to the bottom. But imagine these zones. If you had a container that was super deep and not very wide, I'd imagine you'd get a difference of moisture from the top to bottom where when you are wider, you get a difference of moisture that makes more sense. You have either it's wetter in the top layer or wetter in the bottom, but that gradient isn't so different when you're watering from the top. When you get taller, it becomes harder to accurately measure through a really deep gradient of soil to be accurate. And so those are probably the, the reasons why we've come to squatter being better. Um, outdoors, when you're growing a big plant, you don't want it to just grow 30 feet straight tall. And so we put a big wide container and you're able to get a bigger, wider plant. So I like all things, it really doesn't matter, but the general rule of thumb is the container will kind of mimic the root of what's above. So think of that. And the second thing is that I prefer squatter and it seems like it makes it easier for a number of reasons. And I hope that helps. Let's go on to the next question. Chris says, what do you feel about vermiculite instead of perlite? We don't use any vermiculite. Perlite is better in our, for instance, and I'll give you a couple different reasons. One is when we first started, vermiculite was kind of like perlite in the sense that it was a manufactured ingredient we were trying to get away from. We we're still trying to be at the best quality. And when we add a high percentage of, of compost, we're actually fighting moisture holding. And the reason I say that is you can't just throw everything that you want into a potting soil from a qualitative perspective and expect the ratios of air and carbon and water holding and all of that to be right. And in a potting soil, uh, porosity, texture, all of that becomes much more important than in the ground, especially when we have a timeline we want to keep. So what I will say is that vermiculite holds water and that's why you add it, either to increase the cation exchange or to hold more moisture. So when you go to like a pro mix and you're a gardener uh, or a horticulturist like in our greenhouse, and we have thousands and thousands of seeds we'd like to start at one time. Oftentimes when there's millions, they'll get a certain grade of pro mix for each general type that they're doing. If you have a hanging basket, you can barely put build soil in there because it's full of rock dust and compost that'll sag down on that hanging basket so heavy. So these formulators have gotten really good about the texture, where we're really good about the nutrients and the quality. They're unbelievably good at texture. And what they've said is that if you wanna get a pro mix or a gardening mix that holds more moisture, you should get a vermiculite mix. And if you wanna get one that is really drains well and you can feed faster because it gets drier faster then you want a high perlite mix and so if you just put that in your mind vermiculite perlite although they're both kind of a drainage factor vermiculite holds like a sponge where perlite floats in water and holds air so they're a little bit different um, and now that you know that and you know that moisture holding is a problem for us we already have biochar it holds like 10 times its weight in water we have heavy amounts of compost 
and then peat moss, which once you get break the hydrophobic tendency, it holds water. So adding vermiculite would make that worse for me. And since we already have a heavy soil and we're not looking to mimic water holding in a fake mix, we've bypassed vermiculite. That being said, if I was forced to use it, I could find a way to make it work. Um, so that's why we don't use vermiculite. We don't feel it's necessary, but we do carry it because we are starting to carry mushroom growing supplies and verm vermiculite is important in that industry. Hope that answers your question. Thanks for asking. Uh, next question. Timothy says, when reusing soil, what happens if there are still plenty of nutrients in the soil and I add too much when re-amending? Can a living soil be too hot? You'll notice hot is a term that's used a lot. How much would be too much? Please and thank you, sir. Love the content. Okay, this is a really, really good question because when you first learn about organics, you kind of learn that it's slow release and that it's all safe and it's gentle. So immediately you're like, well, let's put a whole bunch in there. And a whole bunch of organics will reduce your yield significantly. So absolutely, you can overdo it. And this is why when you're using organics, because you can always add more later, it's better to err on the side of caution. Same in hydro. Any bottle you get, you want to cut the dose in half or by quarter when you first use it. In soil, if you've got like a 15 gallon container and you just start amending it by dumping it on a tarp and mixing your nutrients in and then putting it back into the container, you better be right. Because if you overdo certain things, it's going to antagonize the availability of nutrients and cause problems. Now, because the compost acts as a buffer and because these plants are generally really good at growing, you can still get through it but you may not see that it slowed down the growth and it lowered the yield. If I was to be adding things to a top dress layer, it's different. What I mean is you have a wider margin of error when you're adding it into the mulch layer because it's going to be con concentrated in one area on the top where plants are generally used to most of the food being. They reach there, like in the forest, all the leaves fall and they start to decay. And all of that is the nutrition. There's almost none down below. That's where just the minerals and the water are. And so plants are good at that. But if you were to go in the forest and till it all up and dig all the nutrients down deep, it might really affect things. So when you re-amend soil, you wanna be balanced. And that's why soil testing is helpful. I will tell you across every test that I've seen from re-amending, normally adding some calcium, adding some nitrogen back um, are good. And so a lot of times we'll be at minimum adding the calcium back, adding a little bit of compost and adding some general amendments so they're not in excess. Um, otherwise, that's why I like no-till. Instead of dumping, re-amending, dumping, re-amending, and potentially building up, we just go in there and top dress, and we don't overdo it because the plant, usually we're top dressing like before we go to flower. So the plant eats a lot of that top dress before we harvest. And then after we harvest, we add a little more back. Not too much, but enough to make sure the plant's healthy. Then you can read the plant to know if you're over and underdoing it. And as you get better at this, it generally works better for top dressing than it does mixing in. But I, would, I did want to address the point that you can overdo it. Now, to finalize this conversation, you talked about, can it be too hot? Hot is typically a term that comes from excessive nutrients actually causing heat. Hot can mean lots of nutrients. And what I mean is if you were to burn your plant and it wasn't from heat, it would normally be an excess of nutrients like sodium, potassium, things that will stop the healthy uptake of your other nutrients if they were there. But a lot of times in living soil, hot means we, we put all our amendments in the soil, mixed it together, and it physically got hot to the touch where it went thermal over 100 degrees, 150 degrees. It can really ramp up. And that's how you make compost. So any living soil can be too hot, both physically by adding amendments where it actually heats up. And then once that cools back down, if you were excessive in sodium, your soil is too hot and will burn your plants with nutrients. So just because it's organic doesn't mean it can't be too hot, can't burn your plants. However, if you know that sodium mostly comes from the ocean-based materials and that excess in potassium really comes from potassium-based ingredients, you can start to pick and choose how you amend. And if you look at our craft blend or some of our other ingredients, that's how we've found some balance. Um, I know I covered a lot. There's probably gonna need, need to be more details on this and that's going to be like a soil testing conversation. But I think I answered the important points that were you can mess up, do pay attention, less is more. You can always add more in a couple weeks. You can't take it back out. Hope that helps. All right, Ray says, my dad taught me organic gardening for about six years old and still learning. It was just a comment, but it's, it's awesome. And I think that the reason why we put it on here as a comment to mention is that this is part of the process that we want to have happen. I grew up in a cul-de-sac and no one taught me gardening. Um, when I visited my grandparents, she did have a vegetable garden, 
One of the things that I remember though is that she would use miracle Grow and things like that because that's what she just knew. That's what was popular in that era. And then I moved to a small Western town and I found that most of the people out here, if they were like four or five kids and generationally lived out here, they literally grew all their own food, jarred it all, canned it all, knew exactly how to do it. And it was just, it was like normal to them. That to me was something that I just was never in touch with when I was growing up and I wish that was a normal thing. And I feel like there's a big allure for a lot of us to get back in touch with that. So just hearing things like my dad taught me organic gardening from six years old. I just hope we get to hear a lot more of that and I hope that Build a Soil is a part of it and I appreciate you sharing your story. And it's made a huge impact in my life and that's probably why I care so much as I realize how powerful it is. I'm gonna talk about something for just a second. It's like 3D printing and the blueprint is in the seed. It's, it's incredible to literally put a seed in and it knows that's all of the diagram for what it's gonna build and all of the ink in the cartridge is the earth, the periodic table of elements and the nutrients and it's literally gonna build this three-dimensional shape and so it can get you really excited about gardening but then it comes back immediately to well, how do we keep the ink cartridge full? How do we keep the image coming through with, with ultimate clarity? And that's really just balancing soil and following the build of soil way. Let's go on to the next question because I could talk on tangents about that kind of stuff all day long. Taylor says, does flipping the flower affect the lettuce and other veggies that you have going? Yes, but not like you'd think. Um, they're not, they're not going to be based on photo period for producing results, but they are going to be running on DLI. What I mean by that is lettuce is a lower DLI plant, so it doesn't take as much light intensity across a certain number of hours of day to grow. And the reason why I know that is we grow it in a greenhouse with no supplemental lighting all winter long. The difference is it takes twice as long to grow because there's about half as much light. If we were growing at 24 hours under the same light, it would grow twice as fast. One of the tricks that I can do is put a more powerful light above the lettuce for the 12 hours that it's on and I can regain that speed. But I think you'll notice that we weren't really able to keep up with eating that much lettuce anyways. So we're just gonna let it ride out and I'll show you in the coming videos that it's growing just fine. Um, the tomatoes, they don't really care. Um, they can just fruit, keep fruiting and keep fruiting. But similarly, they're gonna have less light than they did before. And so that's gonna factor into things, but they can grow in 12-12. Um, the, the clones that I rooted, I had to take those out. I don't want those to flip to flower. Where all the veggies, totally fine in 12-12. Hope that answers your question. I'm gonna read this one on camera because it's a little detailed. I don't wanna miss any parts. So Corey writes to us, says, I've been running your no-till bundle for the, for the past seven months and I love it. Uh, very little effort on my part. For those of you that don't know, we offer a bundle of our favorite products. It's not like an exact formula. A lot of people use it like that, but it's just our favorite tools that we know if you're gonna grow over the next few months, you're gonna wish you had one of these tools at some point. And so he's been using that no-till bundle for seven months, loves it. And he says, if I wanted to switch over to an earth box, would I keep using things like aloe, yucca, micros, rootwise, etc., and spray them over the soil in place of filling the reservoir? I know the micros would just sit at the bottom of the reservoir if I added them there, but could I add water into the reservoir with aloe, cocoa, or yucca? I get this question all the time. Um, anytime a reservoir is involved, I typically like plain water and that's it. There's, a, there's an exception to that and you're gonna have to tinker, it's up to you. When your plant is drinking a reservoir in one day or one and a half days, it's going quickly. It's not just sitting stagnant because the plant is now big, it's raging with growth. You can probably sneak whatever you want in that reservoir. The challenge comes in the beginning. If you put something in that reservoir and you're not, you're not gonna be, the plant is not drinking the whole reservoir for the first week, it can rot and stagnate. You've added organic matter into the water. There's a little bit of light coming through the tube, it causes algae growth. So I just do plain water until I get to the point where the plant is big. I've added a few things down the reservoir and it's worked, but, but what I try to do is just plain water no matter what. And then the extras that you mentioned, when I notice the reservoir is dry, I peel back the cover and I'll actually spray it in the top dressed area in there. You saw me do a compost tea like this during the YouTube series where I brewed the tea, I pulled the plastic back and I irrigated with the compost tea right into the earth box. That's your trick. You can use yucca, aloe, you can use the micronutrients in there, um, you can use the root wise in there, and it's a really, really good way to get the best of both worlds. And then instead of filling the reservoir that day because you just added a whole bunch of extra moisture, you could wait a day, fill it the next day. No big deal. Um, alternatively, you could pack a large amount of the micros and root wise in a smaller amount of water and irrigate the top with it, and then you could just water like normal. So 
I would say don't put stuff in the reservoir if you can't avoid it, avoid it. And I kind of struggled with this too. I was like, well, I still want to add some of my favorite products. I foliar spray the aloe and the yucca. The micronutrients I absolutely add to the earth box. I don't put in the reservoir. But on that note, the big six micronutrients, the charcoal, the, the uh, humic acid that's in there, it's heavy, it'll sink, but the micronutrients absorb into the water. And so they still would be taken up by the plant. I just think that personally in an earth box, they go so fast, they're so potent. I put extra top dressings into earth box and not as much watering in of things. And in a 15 gallon, a lot of times I'll top dress a little and I'll water in more. I hope that makes sense. In an earth box, you can just keep pounding compost and craft blend and things like that. So you may not need as much of the others, but I do like to take advantage of foliar spray in the earth box because they really like it. They're growing so fast, they get big. Um, but root wise at transplant, I'll also do root wise biofoss going into flower by pulling up the mulch layer, either in a compost tea or by just spraying, spraying it in the top. So I think I've answered your question. Do a little bit of tinkering on your own, but only when the plant is growing super fast when you add it to the reservoir. GSXR600 says, love the videos lately, bro. Well done. Admire you leaving the overwatered one too. Leaving the overwatered Royal Revenge to show all the novice growers out there. Uh, at the end of the day, we're all human and nobody's perfect. We live and learn. And this is really true. I think that I honor being truthful more than I honor showing my weaknesses. So I kind of had to keep it in there so I wasn't lying to you. <laughs> Otherwise, I would love to have never shown any of you that I've up overwatering a plant because it's embarrassing. But like you said, I feel like when you're new, you don't really know how much watering can screw things up. And when you see somebody that grows and their plants veg two to three times as fast as yours and they're able to get more cycles in per year with heavier yield, you start to question everything. And um, if all you're doing different than me is just the watering practices and you can see that your plants are smaller, it's such a good vision to show people, hey, this got overwatered. Not only did I not have to just throw the plant away or kill it, but you can save it. You can turn it around and bring back 100% of the plant health. But what I couldn't do was give it that extra week of veg that it missed and it's very apparent next to its sisters, which did not get that week delay. And I'll say this again, I say it a lot, but in living soil, in organic styles of growth, the most important thing that we can do as a steward of our plant's health is not just feed the best food and throw a bunch of expensive stuff at them, but have discipline, learn the lessons of life, give the discipline to those plants so that they understand when they're going to receive it in the balanced approach, and they will be, they will reward you so much better than any other garden in the sense that if you don't have that discipline and you don't do things on time and you start to get behind, your garden will be significantly slower than it could be. If you overwater, you can see that it messes things up. And so follow the discipline in the garden, understand how much overing and underwatering affects you and don't be scared by it, just learn from it. If your plants aren't growing quite as fast as you want, know that watering can be the biggest factor. So when we have customers call in and they're asking questions, a lot of times they're saying, look at my plant is looking a little unhappy. What food do I need to feed it? You'll notice that I didn't do that. I just stopped the watering and I slipped a compost tea in there because I want it to have some easily absorbable, but realistically nothing changed until I just stopped watering. And then the roots got healthy. It got enough air in the root zone and was able to start eating its own food again. And then I could go back to normal. Only trick you can sometimes do if you mess up with the watering is to foliar spray like amino acids, things like that, and kind of force feed the plant. Beyond that, it's better to just learn this thing and get it right. So I appreciate the comment. I'm kind of, you know, in hindsight, now that we've had that happen, I'm pretty glad that we left that in the video and decided to show it, show it to you guys. So I think that's the last question that we had loaded for the day. I just wanted to make sure that continually throughout this cycle, we at least take a few questions, sit down, take the time to answer them because you're taking the time to sit here in front of the computer and actually watch me, which I'm still kind of blown away by. I just geek out on this. It's my favorite thing to do. And a lot of times I talk to other employees here, we're all growers. So we don't realize how important this information is. It's just stuff we talk about every day. This is stuff that if build a soil went away, I'd still be doing every single day for the rest of my life. We're just that into it. And so to know that other people are too, it like creates a connection. It's real. We appreciate you asking the questions. If you've got more of them, keep loading them up. We're gonna go through every week, pick some of our favorites and just make sure that we answer them. I am gonna leave town for a little bit. I've got some other things happening here at the shop, which is great, we're gonna highlight. And when I get back, I'm definitely gonna dig into some more FAQ questions and make sure that we address as many as we can throughout the series. Thanks, and I'll catch you on the next FAQ.